Hi, I'm Dr. James Roby, Global Head of Environmental Sustainability at Capgemini. Please let me add my welcome to you to today's event. We all know that most multinational organizations are acutely aware of their responsibilities towards the environment. And at Capgemini, we're no different. We started putting our own sustainability program in place now over 15 years ago. We were one of the first to set science-based targets back in 2016. And since 2020, we've been committed to becoming a net zero business. However, as a professional services company, we recognize that our carbon footprint is relatively modest compared to many of our clients. Consequently, alongside our own decarbonization commitments, we've set a target to help our clients reduce their carbon impacts. And we're now systematically embedding sustainability across our entire portfolio of client services. As part of this program, this year, we've launched our Future Proofing Innovation event, a series of roundtable conversations across different sectors and countries. Together with clients, partners, and other leading thinkers, we're discussing the crucial role that technology and innovation can play in sustainability. Clearly, the retail and consumer products industry has been at the forefront of many of the sustainability battles and quite a few victories when it comes to sustainability. The topic of food waste, for one, stands at the core of the food value chain today. The crucial importance of creating healthier and more sustainable products is now a priority for leading players in the industry. That's not to say that this transformation is easy. Even measuring the precise carbon footprint of a product is a topic which isn't without its challenges. So today, I'm delighted that we've gathered a selection of leading experts, industry players and innovators to discuss this critical topic of future-proofing innovation. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, thank you, James. Um, and everyone, welcome to this Consumer Goods and Retail Roundtable uh, discussion uh, in the Netherlands. As James indicated, focus is on sustainability and innovation in the consumer goods and retail industry with a spe specific focus on food. So my name is Kees Jacobs. I'm part of the global Capgemini consumer goods and retail team uh, and focus on insights and data across the end-to-end -end value chain. And I'm privileged to be here at this table together with you. Let me do a quick uh, round before we start our discussions. So we have Chris Webster, uh, SVP IT Strategy and Architecture at Ahold Deleuze. Fanny Weinbreck, Global R&D Director at Royal Agri-Firm Group. We have Jesse Atlam, co-founder and partner of Brave New Food. We have Jackie Pinadath, Director of Sustainability and Innovation at Google Cloud. Unfortunately, Jackie couldn't be with us, but we are very happy for you to join remotely. We have Lauren Sloot, Founder and Director of EFMI Business School and Professor at the University of Groningen. We have Ron Toledo, Executive VP and Chief Technology Officer and Master Architect at Capgemini. And last, but definitely not least, we have Lisa Verbeek, the voice of the young generation, social influencer, and um, also project lead for the Food for a Better World initiative. And her role is also to keep us honest in our discussions. So we are living in times of <coughs> unprecedented disruptions. Um, that are also interconnected, whether it's economic disruptions, inflations, whether it's geopolitical conflicts, whether it's supply chain disruptions, whether it's labor crisis, uh, whether it's the energy transition. But overarchingly, the focus for today, it's, it's all about sustainability. Um, it's about um, uh, purpose, climate change, um, and the impact that that has on the consumer goods and, and retail industry. But it is especially also a time of unprecedented opportunities um, because the sense of urgency is more and more clear across the board and uh, momentum is there for new approaches that go beyond current borders and um, uh, that, that actually overcomes traditional conventions. This is also the trigger for our Food for a Better World initiative, which is aiming at bringing uh, uh, actors across the end-to-end -end value chain together to do the kind of things that individual companies cannot do, to accelerate the transition to a healthy and more sustainable food system. So in this round table, we'll cover three topics. Uh, so first, we'll start uh, with sustainable sourcing and end-to-end uh, -end value chain transparency. Second is food waste. And the third topic is actually, how do we engage as an industry with consumers in living healthier and more sustainable lives? 
So let's first focus on the sustainable sourcing and end-to-end -end supply chain uh, transparency. And, and this relates to what we all know uh, as uh, scope three. Um, and it means also that uh, this is about uh, um, collaborative ecosystems. This, this means um, your scope three is also my scope three. But we have seen in a recent research that we've done that only 11% of companies are truly active engaged in collaborative initiatives, in advanced collaborative initiatives here. But also that those companies that do, that they significantly outperform others, peers who are more lagging uh, in, in having these collaborative approaches. It's not just about reporting, it's, it's about you know, enjoying through business benefits uh, from that. But it's also complex, of course. So let me start first, Jackie, uh, with you. So what do you see happening across the value chain in, in setting up sustainable um, sourcing using data? Sure, so thank you. That's a, that's a really great question. Um, I would say that there's a couple ways that, uh, that we would approach this from a technology perspective, of course. Um, I think one of the things that we bring to the table is how to use data at scale um, you know, at petabyte, you know, massive, massive aggregating, you know, massive amounts of, uh, of data, and then coupling that with some additional type of capabilities, for example, like our geospatial uh, and remote sensing capabilities to kind of help, you know, how you might look at where you're actually sourcing, uh, you know, or potential commodities from, so some of the raw materials and looking at the traceability. So we have, uh, we've historically had a long, <laughs> Uh, uh, we have a lot of history with using our Google Earth Engine, for example, to be very specific, and that's been out there for, for decades, m mainly in the research and kind of innovation, right, research and, and NGO type of space. We pivoted as a company uh, earlier this year, and we're now trying to make our Google Earth Engine uh, capabilities available for commercial consumption because it's so important for companies and try in terms of how they try to meet their objectives around you know sustainability and ESG for example trying to prevent deforestation in the supply chain how do you do that and and here's a way that we can accelerate that type of um, effort by using this type of capability um, a great example that I'd like to illustrate to be to, to hopefully make it really clear on what I was thinking of is the work that we've done with Unilever so Unilever, as a consumer products company, um, one of the things that they've done, a top line objective is how they prevent deforestation in their supply chain. And so we help them uh, basically with their data platform and we accelerated it by bringing our, our Google Earth Engine capabilities on top so that you can actually see uh, where the raw materials, for example, the palm oil is actually coming from. And you can see you know, where it's being sold uh, or, or brought to the local mill and then how that gets uh, produced and, and, and did that you know, palm oil that was sourced, did it contribute to deforestation or not? So there's a there's a real case for kind of using, um, you know, these extra type of capabilities and technologies to help with, mm -hmm. um, you know, validating this this particular case. Um, and and it, it's very exciting. I mean, we're very focused on raw material and traceability, and this is one of the examples. So that was no, thank you. how thank I would... And it's interesting you mentioned Unilever as a CPG brand. Um, Chris, if you look at, at, at you know, your end for, as a retailer mm -hmm. uh, and, and at end-to-end -end sourcing or end-to-end -end transparency, what do you see happening in collaboration? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, first of all, it's probably worth that actually we have set ourselves a target to be um, carbon neutral in scope three emissions by 2050 and in our own operations by 2040, which may not sound that ambitious, but when you look at the scale of the challenge, it's really quite enormous. Yes. Um, so actually, and we have done a couple of things in terms of supply chain transparency, notably with using some blockchain solutions, which enable us to trace orange juice back to the source of the oranges. So we've done that. We've also done the same with eggs, and we've made that visible to our customers. Um, so on any individual case, it's quite easy. But the challenge that we face is simply trying to understand the full spectrum of the sources of our food. So if we take, um, you know, potentially beef production out of South America, we then have to worry about actually the soy uh, beans which are grown in South America, which are then used to feed the cattle, which then have to be transported across it. And simply trying to understand the sheer number of sources, which are local farmers who are providing their soy beans to a collective. On any given day, the collective may or may not source soybeans from any individual farmer. And actually even knowing who they are, 
There is no structural database anywhere in the world which says where are the locations of all of those, those farmers of the soybeans and what kind of um, fertilizers or pesticides or, or manure that they use to actually grow their soybeans. So the challenge in when you want to actually measure anything is really, really, really enormous. And this, I think, becomes an industry collective challenge because it's not just ourselves, it's also the meat providers, it's also the Safitras and the Cargills and the big um, you know, food um, conglomerates that need to work together. And I think if we don't see this as an industry challenge, I think we'll fail because actually any individual company cannot solve it. We probably have, I would guess there might be a million upstream locations in our supply chain. Right. And that just trying to identify who they are, where they are, and certify that they are who they say they are in itself is a, is a problem we have not solved yet. Yeah. So that's indeed a, a, an opportunity also on the upstream side. Maybe <coughs> going to the upstream viewpoint, uh, Fanny, I mean, your uh, place upstream in the value chain, what's your perspective? Yeah, I, th I think what we see from an agri-firm perspective is very important to have this traceability as well and to have this transparency. When it comes to raw material, I think Jackie already mentioned, but Chris as well, this is also what we are, what we are looking for. When it comes to scope three, we want to be able to have the full transparency in terms of, uh, of, of supply chain of, of this raw material. When it comes to feed, scope three has a huge, huge impact. Um, and also, as mentioned, we also work in more the arable and plant part. And then we also see the value of the data and the value of sensors when it comes to use of pesticides, use of fertilizers as well. So I think there's the, it's moving it's moving to that direction, but we are not there yet. Mm. And I think gathering all these data and ways to measure that, that's really the way forward. And when also when it comes to, to raw material, we also need to have a plan. And this is what we do now currently on the short, medium and long term. So we are talking, for instance, about deforestation. So we need to look at the very short term what we can do, but also look at the, uh, at the longer term in terms of local, going circular. All these kind of, of topics are, I think, very important to take into account as well. Thank you. Uh, so if, if, if we then look at the role of, of innovations in this, uh, yes, any, anything, because you're working with a lot of food uh, startups, do you, do you see how? Yes, yeah, we, we, we started two years ago and um, we focus on, on, on several uh, subjects, among others, food waste, and I was surprised or even amazed how many initiatives there are around this topic. It's very, a hot topic for, for many young entrepreneurs. And um, um, uh, we have examples of, of, of initiatives where they, they look at uh, the, the tomato losses in Kenya, where 50% of the crop is, is, is lost due to a lack of knowledge or poor storage conditions. Or So you see a lot of initiatives where they try to solve these kind of uh, imperfections or uh, I think it's 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 recognized as a big topic, and obviously it's it's translated in in maybe small scale solutions yet, but um, yeah, we do see a lot of uh, initiatives there. Okay, interesting. So so Laurens, if you have a bit of an academic view on this, uh, you know, what what is do you see the role of companies here and how they should step up maybe more than they are currently doing? Well, I I, uh, I really favor the book of Paul Pullman. Uh, Unilever has already mentioned uh, and where the vision of Paul Pullman is that if you know that the change has to come, you can better be at the forefront um, because then, then you're close to innovation and you can also, you're close to improving your own business model in the, uh, in the end. And uh, I think that's a role, especially for many leading companies or companies yeah. who, want to, who want to lead. Um, and, and I also see it in the end as, as, as a major opportunity yeah, to transform business, uh, to do better business. Um, what I thought was interesting is what, what Chris was saying that, that maybe there are a million farmers busy uh, producing stuff which end up at stores at Ahold in the US and, and in, in Europe. And it's quite difficult uh, uh, if you think about tracking and tracing to, to have an oversight for the whole chain. Yeah. And I think what's also important that if we, if we, yeah, if we focus on scope three and, and meeting those targets, that it doesn't imply that we only source from Europe. And because for the economic development, it's very important for many South African and, and, and African and Asian countries that they can also sell their stuff. And so we should also think about uh, tracking and tracing systems which, which are affordable for, for the many very small farmers. Good point. And it's, it's a difficult one, but there's also a lot of opportunity in, in that space. But you talk about transformation. There's also 
there's the element of technology, and I'll come back to you, Ron, in a moment. But sure. there's also the element of people and culture and ethics and, and behaviors and so on. Lisa, any you know, you are a bit of the younger generation, which is teaching uh, you know, the rest of the generation stuff. What what, what are your viewpoints in, in how companies should transform in that in, in that respect? Yeah, uh, good question. What I what I see is increasingly customers be becoming more aware and more critical. I think I can say about indeed the the origin of products, the uh, the, the 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 level of to what extent those products are organic or not, to what extent there's been paid a fair price, to what extent the labor conditions were were in the right way. Right. I mean. I think today we're focusing a bit more on the environmental side of sustainability, but there's, of course, a, a very big social side specifically con like linked to the food system. So, yeah, I really see that, that um, well, I guess for, for consumers, it's, it's mostly the retailer who they're, they're uh, uh, in direct contact with. But, of course, their demands immediately influence the entire value chain up to, indeed, the farmers who yeah whose decisions and, and, and whose... So the customer has specific ideas about, okay, I, I, I do want a product that is uh, indeed a, a farm produced, manufactured, uh, transported, stored in, in a right way, and, and also a way that links to like your personal purpose and uh, the, your, the lifestyle choices that you make as a, as a customer, and of course the, the products as well that you can afford. But um, I see immediately that, yes, those requirements, they would also influence the entire value chain up to, to yeah, our all our um, perspective and influences. So yeah, I really see a big change there. And I also see that in the past years, this awareness of customers has, has dramatically, or at least I would say optimistically increased. Uh, I, I see it in my, in my own environment, um, <coughs> but uh, we also see it in the numbers. And it's, it's both for yeah, the consumer or customer perspective as well as employee perspective. Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, this is very critical, absolutely. Yeah. And just to reinforce that point, the information that we would like to have about our upstream supply chain, ethical sourcing, ethical labour, yes. not, not um, caused by deforestation. So it's not just about the carbon content, it's no, also about no. all these upstream attributes. Yes. And so it's a really complex data yeah. problem. And specifically related to food, right? Like yeah. you have the, the greenhouse gas emissions, but you have to also have the deforestation that Jackie mentioned already, the quality of soil, the air pollution. Exactly, uh, uh, groundwater, like it, it's insane. I think food system, I mean, uh, uh, the food system is responsible for one third of, of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. It's enormous, but I even think, and I, I love it how biodiversity is also one of the topics that's increasingly we're having discussions on, but is, is already, I, I would say, uh, sometimes even more complex than, than carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, because it's, it's more difficult to measure. But those uh, effects, yeah, they're, they're enormous. So it's up to us to uh, contribute. Yeah. If I could add to what Lisa was saying, I think adding on to the, um, you know, the, the use of technology, for example, how to collect more demographic information on at-risk communities, right, in the, you know, in the smallholder farms and how do you use that type of information? How do you use AI and other types of capabilities to kind of help with these um, the, you know, these communities that are, you know, that are vulnerable and, and, and need this type of help. So we've talked a lot about like the product, the things coming out of the soil and all the things that kind of go around that. But it's also, you know, the human element, I think, is what you were all saying. So I was yeah. suggesting we've got some clients or we've got some companies in our portfolio that we work with um, that definitely focus on that. One of them is Atlas AI, and that's a big focus of theirs on going into these at-risk communities and using AI to kind of help measure those types of things. So as another kind of flavor of what you were suggesting. I had a question to Chris because uh, a few years ago, Aholt made the whole orange juice supply chain transparent. And, and to, to what kind of challenges did you meet uh, in this process? I wasn't personally involved in that, so I don't know exactly what we came across. But, I, but um, because it's... Um, it was our own brand, so it was a, it was a kind of a an isolated supply chain. Yeah. So it's within our own control as to what we expect people to do, and we actually picked a, a supplier who was able to do that in South America for us. So they actually did the legwork locally. So so the critical thing there was it was a self-contained isolated supply chain, so we had full control. I think the real the, when you try to make that generic go across the whole industry, um, and so we we specified our technical standards. 
So we set our own technical standards. But if you're going to get the industry to adopt technical standards, well, I've worked with Case for 20 odd years on something called the Global Commerce Initiative, trying to define standards for mass data that definition. Is, and that's still a work in progress. And, and actually, <laughs> there's a new initiative that started because the difficulty with standards nowadays is that there are so many of them. Yeah. And yeah. you know how, how to navigate uh, yeah. there. So uh, one is one is I think you make it generic. It's the, it's yeah. defining a set of standards to which the whole industry can mm -hmm. sign up yeah. to. And I think we were lucky and we just picked on one. I think the other observation I would make is that we did monitor. We we put you know labels on our products which enabled customers to scan a code and then look at what was happening. But whilst I agree with you, there is an increased interest that things are being done. The people who actually use the information given to them are very few. I'd like to wrap up this this part. Uh, it's good that we have this kind of passion. Uh, we we did start with the, the 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 technology. Ron, is there before we go to the next topic any um, word of wisdom when it comes to the you know the opportunity that technology is offering? Well, I, I hear phenomenal challenges, right, or insane insane situations. Yeah. But on the other hand, we also have phenomenal technology, and we have insane opportunities with technology as well. And I already heard a few, you know technologies that, that even a few years ago where you didn't really have that available. I already heard blockchain, for example. I heard uh, sensors, a AI, particularly in its ability to, to augment humans in, in uh, the, the things that we're doing. So, so, so I think the big opportunity is here to think a little bit outside the box. It's, it's not only a matter of applying technology to what we consider an insane or very complex situation, but, but sometimes if you apply, for example, AI and intelligent automation and, and the use of sensors at the edge, everywhere on the grounds, but also very easy ways of connecting people that usually, you know, would find it difficult to connect. And you realize you could also re-engineer the way you think about a, a supply chain, about a, a process, about a community. So, so I do realize that in the end, it's also always about people, uh, because if they don't change, uh, nothing will happen. On the other hand, we should realize that technology enables us to do things. Um, so, so to, to, to challenge that complexity and, and the insanity almost, the insanity of it um, through, through technology, I, I find a very um, inspiring idea and, and challenges every day and, and we get more opportunities every day. So. Let, let's get back to that yeah. in a moment. So if we switch gears now to the second topic, which is food waste. So recently we've done um, a big research on food waste, um, including consumer research. And what we see is that um, their consciousness on food waste is uh, also significantly uh, um, staggering there. And we, on for the example, consumer, consumer so level, or? consumer. So we see, mm -hmm. for example, uh, an 80 percent year on year increase on you know, Google, uh, Google searches of consumers. How can I extend uh, the life of my uh, food products? So consumers have three uh, big emotions when it comes to food waste. So one relates to themselves, which is guilt. They feel guilty if they waste food. But there's, there are two other emotions. One is anger, and the second one is disappointment. And those two relate specifically to the roles that companies could be playing for them, in their view. So let's, um, yes, uh, let's talk, talk with you and, and yeah. the, the food innovators. What, what do you see? How, you know, what's happening? Yeah, as I said uh, previously, I think this is a topic which is really uh, top of mind on, 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 on many young entrepreneurs and, and uh, clearly uh, they are among the 80% are highly involved. And it's, 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 it's um, every direction. So I mentioned the example of, of rescuing the tomatoes in, in Kenya and, and making a premium ketchup out of it. But it's also, uh, so we have here products on the table uh, we will finish them all, but uh, I, I know a startup which invented an in intelligent waste bin, which, which photographs everything which goes in and tells you as uh, an hotel owner or restaurant owner after a week or a month uh, how you should uh, change or adjust your buying process, your assortment. Your so um, it's, it's, it's data driven, it's, it's product driven. Um, I think uh, over we had over 800 pitches the last two years, I think maybe 200 of them were around food waste. So it's, it's upstreaming, it's, it's gaining uh, proteins from, from uh, brewers spent grains. It's, it's um, amazing how many uh, uh, things are happening there. But also shelf life um, extensions with edible coatings on, on veg or fruit, um, uh, uh, different ways of packaging. So it's, it's, it's clearly top of mind. Yeah. 
what I what I love there is that uh, these startups they take a societal problem and they use a, a business as a form to solve the problem. Yeah, it's purpose driven. It's business. exactly yeah. purpose driven. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and of course you have to uh, have uh, create a healthy business mm -hmm. and make money. Uh, in order to keep this uh, impact going. But the entire purpose, it's so holistic. I, yeah. I love it, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> Maybe if we take that angle also to the upstream positioning that you are in, in our earlier conversations, you talked about uh, circularity and yeah. recycling. Yeah, so I, I think a very important topic and what we are currently innovating on is making use of circularity also as a kind of business, but um, uh, so generally speaking, when we look at the food waste from the food industry, how can we re reuse that to feed, for instance, animals or to make use of them for, um, for fertilizers or for plant perspective. So we are already currently doing that, right? So this is already happening as we speak, but there's also limitations currently in, in, in going circular. So I think one of the limitation is, uh, for instance, the origin, the nutrition of, of, of specific streams or byproducts. And I think it's very important to innovate there to, uh, to, to, to up, upcycle these nutrition uh, streams to make sure that we use them to the proper way. And in the second um, aspect I would like to put forward is also making a clear decision on when we use a land or when we use a product, whether it's for human consumption or whether it's for animal consumption or whether it's for plant consumption. I think we can be much, much sharper there in how we make use of the resources we have on this planet to the best use. Yeah. And, and this, this requires a holistic approach. <coughs> yeah. And that's exactly why uh, animals, the, the, the environmental impact of eating meat is so enormous, right? Because it it's not only about the animal, it's about this entire process to get the anim animal uh, a place to stay, uh, enough food, etc. It's Indeed. Exactly. And making use and making a, a good decision on what has to be fed to the animal to yes. have the least impact possible. Yeah. Uh, this is really something we need to move forward. Yeah. yeah, and to, for example, also use the food waste that we create instead of virgin materials. Yeah. And the role of the retailer, Chris? Well, I, I, first of all, I suppose, I think as a proportion of food waste, we probably produce relatively little of the total in terms of the things we actually waste. It's only a small single digit percentage. Having said that, we are committed, we've set ourselves target publicly published um, in terms of reducing our food waste as a percentage of sales. So we're doing that. And what we're now doing is we're now actually measuring you know, actually physically measuring, recording out of the system and weighing it and differentiating whether that, whether that food waste goes to animal feed, in which case it probably doesn't count as waste, whether it goes to, you know, actually to food banks if it's still resellable, or whether it goes to anaerobic digesters for actually generating of, of, of gases and things like that. And, and we yeah. are, so we're, we're recording where that waste is going and looking at ways in which we can kind of put more to areas which are sort of the circular economy reusing that food waste rather than actually simply putting it in landfill, which is clearly the worst thing you can possibly do. So that is something we're doing across the business. The other thing we're doing actually is, um, I don't know if we've seen it yet in the Netherlands, is we are using a combination of electronic shelf edge labels yeah. with, um, with, with some AI, which determines how do we mark down products um, that, are, that are basically dynamic markdown, yeah, we call it, not dynamic, yes, not dynamic yes, pricing, yes. dynamic markdown, to reduce the price of items that are getting near their sell-by date, yeah. And what we're also able to do is even when you've got a, um, a bin which has got um, products with different sell-by dates, we're using the data bar, which includes the sell-by date, so that when you get to the checkout, you get the correct price for the sell-by date of the product that you've, you're, you've selected from the shelf. And that is visible on the shelf edge because mm -hmm. it's, it's also visible in the electronic shelf edge label. So these are sorts of things encouraging customers to buy mm -hmm. food at a lower price mm -hmm. as it's towards the end of its yeah. sell-by date. But of course, hopefully then the consumer knows it's near the end of the sell-by mm -hmm. date does actually then use it within the, within the appropriate amount of time. Yeah, yeah. But, but those it's... sorts of things enable us to kind of make sure mm -hmm. that we, 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 are, we are able to sell the things through. Um, yes, I mean, there's, there's also an economic benefit to ourselves mm -hmm. because we'd rather sell it than put it in the bin, but sure. also it contributes towards reducing food it waste. Also saves time in the store, eh? If the consumer is looking yeah. for the right date and they yeah. receive a discount for 20, 25%, yeah. well, the consumer solves the problem. Yeah. And, and they accept it better because yeah. maybe organic, you know, the taste might be slightly different, and, and but then they accept it because yeah. they pay a... Yeah, but from a technological point of view, is, is, is a QR code needed extra? Because no, the, it's, a, the, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's the longer data, a lot of data it's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a one dimensional code, but it's a longer code. Yeah, so that can be read by the cashier. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's an industry wide uh, sunrise date yeah. 2027 that all uh, 
POS systems across the world need to be able to read the two-dimensional uh, code uh, that include not yeah. only the GTIN number, the, the trade item number, the product number, but also other uh, data yeah. fields mm -hmm. like that before. So, yeah. If I could add a sure. couple, two other elements into the, especially the retail, from a retail perspective, um, to kind of uh, talk about food waste. We, I, there's two other areas I think that I think are, are, are very good um, opportunities. One is actually just looking at your demand forecasting, right? So how you actually do your demand forecasting. And, and Chris, I wish it was with your, your store uh, or your brand. I, I, I'll, there was another brand <laughs> that we're working with where we did something similar. So I'd like to do that at Albert Hein, um, but we actually worked with another large uh, grocery retailer to help them with how they do their demand forecasting on how they with the with the fresh made food in the stores, right? So like the fresh baked bread and things like that to kind of figure out a way to actually reduce the amount of food waste on that. So that's like you know a very practical example that I think I wanted to at least put into the conversation. And mm -hmm. then another element that I thought is also interesting is um, we have uh, you, maybe you've all heard of the company Karma. Have you all heard of Karma, the um, the food the food rescue app? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, so there's yeah. a it's a Swedish company that's been around for quite a while, and they have this the, a really interesting model where it, they provide a, a platform for retailers to sell their surplus food, right? So to kind of you know keep it going, and so that's been around for quite a while. And of course, they're they work on our technology, but again, it comes back to you know the demand forecasting side and how that goes. So I just wanted to put kind of two other elements of, I think, interesting um, topics into this overall, right. um, you know, discussion. And hopefully you can hear me okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing is that, and we'll come back to that later, is, but this, this is also where uh, purpose and performance go hand in hand, because, you know, you will save costs if you do a better yeah. forecast, you know, it, uh, on that. So may, may I ask, uh, just having you on the table, uh, um, I've always also the impression that there's a, a lot of potential if, if retailer and grower and especially when abroad are working more closely together because I think that there is also quite some potential in understanding each other's specifications. If the retailer says it, these di dimensions, these coloring, this bricks, this whatever, mm -hmm. and the grower after listening to his importer or trader uh, is stuck with this specification and, and, and is unable to meet it, he probably produces twice as much in order to have significant volumes within specification. We call it waste, but I would consider it more overproduction. So is, is this something which is also part of the... I mean, the first program? point is it, it's not something which I'm, I'm sort of aware of within our company. I, I give a personal view. And <laughs> yeah. uh, my that personal view is I think that collectively the retailer and the producer have a job in kind of educating yeah. customers. Yes. That what something looks like is not a quality question. Yes. No. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it was, it's what it smells like and tastes like and yeah. things like that. The things that they look slightly odd shapes, well, they can be perfectly edible and very, actually very tasty. Yeah. And a lot of organic produce actually, you know, appearance wise might look less. Yeah. But that's a personal view. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's, I think it's a, an industry challenge to educate the, the customer that mm -hmm. actually not to equate you know, the lemons must be perf this perfect shape and round and Precisely. everything with no but little I'm, blemishes on I'm the skin. That is happening. But it is, but I think we've, we've kind of trained the customer to yeah. expect that and now yeah. we need to untrain them yeah. or, or train them in a new um, yeah. Uh, yeah. way of thinking. We'll, we'll come back Educate also to the them. role of consumer yeah. in, in a yeah. moment. But uh, before finishing off on this topic of food waste, because um, you alluded to it, it requires also sharing of data mm -hmm. uh, across the value chain. Ron, any from a technology perspective, any any uh, views you can share on data sharing? Well, we, we've done quite some research. Our Archive Gemini Research Institute has, has done quite some work in uh, understanding data collaboration and data ecosystems. Uh, it's, it's very much, you know, a lot of technologists tend to think, you know, the technology foundations are crucial in here, that creating the platforms, creating safe exchange of data, which you could call the foundations, uh, but then the behaviors in terms of the willingness to actually collaborate and, and having everybody realize that they, that they want to exchange data to, to you know, achieve a certain purpose is something different, right? And, and it's always a balanced game between these two. I have to say, by the way, uh, data, of course, is mentioned every third sentence almost in terms of its, its power to, to um, you know, facilitate a lot of the changes that we're looking for. The interesting thing, of course, is that it's also quite a wasteful thing, data itself. So, so I'm actually involved quite a lot these days in battling against data waste because storing a lot of data everywhere and having that redundancy, 
you know, it's, it's actually a very costly thing in terms of the environment and potentially money as well. So, so storing data, um, analyzing data, applying, you know, fancy AI machine learning to it can, can burn a lot of, of energy, can create a lot of e-waste. So, so interesting enough, if, if, we, if we leverage data more to, to and, and other technology that, that is energy consuming and not necessarily sustainable, if, if we apply that more and more to, to achieve what we want to achieve, we, we also need to realize that there's a balance act. I find that very interesting. So, so we're yeah. discussing food waste, but actually at the same line and in the same way, you could be looking at data waste because it's the same thing. Where does it come from? Yeah. Where do we store it? Should we store it? several places or could we maybe share something instead of replicating it uh, who's responsible for it how long what, how long do we keep data before it perishes so so there's a, a lot of interesting analogy over here that, that i find instructive you know that it people can learn a lot from as well yeah so that's yeah. i think some some yeah. good food for thought um uh, food for thoughts yeah. Yeah. Um, but on the topic of waste so not only food waste yeah. or product waste but material waste, waste but also -waste. data waste yeah no but i, I totally agree because i i find a lot that we would easily say no technology will solve it yeah right well yeah. if you look at the total cost of well ownership or like the total impact of uh, one specific choice, and it could it could also be like having a a, a paper uh, a, a sign or a digital sign, which mm -hmm. can be reused many times. But you really have to look at the entire cycle of indeed materials being used, how long it's being used, how the data is being stored, uh, uh, on what uh, data center it's stored. Right, Jackie, that's that's your uh, quality, and so. Yeah, you really have to look quite broadly there, I think. And also sustainability from an IT perspective really requires a different view. And it says something about what, how you uh, enable your user to use the technology, but it's also from a design perspective already that you influence the environmental footprint of that. Yeah, and, and, it, and it is a matter of, of eating your own dog food while we're at the topic anyway, yeah. or as, the, as, as we as a French company would say, drinking your own champagne. But, but the thing is, if, if we from an IT side, from an IT strategy side, uh, you know, promotes a lot of use of technology to solve. And indeed, in, in all different ways, uh, the, the issues that we have, at the same time, we need to apply that thinking to ourselves. Yeah. So we tell people, hey, we can make you more sustainable, we can help you battle food waste. And, and then we, we need to drink our own champagne or eat our own dog food and applying these principles to IT and, and digital transformation as well. So that's very interesting balance act there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in the end, um, tackling food waste and becoming fully circular, everything which is produced, it will, will be a bigger battle than uh, transforming to green energy, uh, which is technically yeah, possible definitely. in 20, 30 years. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah because of the sy systemic uh, complexity, right? And yeah. the entire value chain, which, which is correct. topical. The impact yeah. that it has. Yeah. And also the growing population yeah. coming up. I mean, it's yeah. So talking about the growing population, talking about consumers, we talked already a few times about the role of consumers or what's happening on food waste, but also imperfect good uh, foods and so on. Um, so maybe start a question uh, for you, Laura. And so <coughs> what do you see as the role for retailers and brands when it comes to enabling consumer consumers to live healthier and uh, more sustainable lives? Do you leave it to yeah. them to make their own decisions or where do you enable them? I, I like it that people can choose freely. Eh? But also, uh, when I was born, there were 3 billion people. Now I think there are 8 billion and probably there will be 10 or 11 billion in 2050 and 2060. And, and many countries will grow in, in welfare and cross domestic products. So what are these people going to do? Uh, they are going probably uh, consuming more and also consuming more uh, animal proteins unless we have very good technological solutions for that. Uh, so the, the, ch the challenge for technology uh, to um, intensify production, uh, a, a better uh, transformation from nutrition to end products, uh, tackling food waste uh, will, will, will even get much bigger than uh, smaller. To be honest, it, it will be the, the biggest challenge is, is, is in front of us and probably in the next 30 or 40 years. And because I see the, the amount of people on Earth growing until I think 10 or 11 billion, and then we will go slightly to, to 10, 9, 8, and maybe in 200 years uh, back to 2, 3 or 4 billion in a more natural way. And, and only in that case, we can 
produce in a more, let's say, organic and nature-inclusive way. If we would do that now, we would really face enormous problems. We cannot feed the world with traditional farming methods, to be honest. Yeah. But also, when it comes to nudging consumers in their decisions, so respecting their decisions. Yeah, but, but, but I'm, I'm not, <clears throat> I think nudging can help, but it's very small, uh, small amount. I, I believe more in true pricing as an economist, to be honest, say that you really look at the external, externality, so CO2, methane, uh, NH3, those kind of uh, things that you price them in the product, and maybe then beef is, is, is becoming two or three euros more expensive per, per kilo, Maybe pig meat or chicken meat, uh, one or 1.5 euro. Maybe fish, a uh, half a euro. And probably plant-based food is becoming cheaper because they yeah. cut CO2 so from the atmosphere. Exactly. And, and then not only consumers can shift their demand a little bit, but I think more important is that companies can innovate so that they reduce CO2, methane, or, or, or other types of externality. So it can true pricing can work in, in two ways. Right. Maybe funny for you to to reflect on, because um, we talked also about true pricing and, and you know what what do consumers value from from that angle? Yeah, I I, th I think we have indeed a huge challenge ahead. We already have innovative solution that we can use, and from a cooperative perspective, I also see that the farmers would like to apply those innovative solutions. Some of those innovative solutions have a price, and then the question is who's going to pay for it, right? So. Um, so if, if the incentive of, from a farmer perspective is going down, there's also not really a, a willingness also or, you know, to, to move forward. So I strongly believe also in true pricing because if we want to move ahead, we also need to make efforts and, and look throughout the value chain how to compensate for the extra prices that we are doing. So with the current innovation, but we also need more innovations to make sure that we reach our goal. So I'm one example that would be possible Apologies, Chris, for that, but it's also a kind, we see more and more short, short chains, right? When the consumers are directly in contact with the farmers and when they also see, well, what does that mean for, for me? What does that mean for the farmer? And then hopefully we can also create a little bit more awareness from a consumer perspective on what's, yeah, what is happening uh, uh, in the chain. Yeah. So let's not further deep dive on the commercial sensitivities no. of, of, of that. Um, <laughs> but maybe linking, Chris, the, uh, there's a big role for retailers also uh, when it comes to engaging with consumers. And you see on health, for example, uh, Nutri scores um, uh, or eco scores when, when yeah. it comes to sustainability. But we also see that there are many of them. So, uh, yeah, I mean, mean, so again, we have actually we set ourselves a target, um, which I think is to achieve fifty five percent of our own brand sales is as what we call healthy sales by in the next two or three years. And we have adopted um, within Europe the Nutri-Score system um, as a way of sort of simplistically categorizing products from A to E and an equivalent system which we, we developed in the US called Guiding Stars, which does an equivalent. And that that give, the idea is to give transparency to the consumer of things which are perceived as healthy. Um, in some markets, notably Belgium, we actually, through the loyalty scheme, we give you increased points in your in your loyalty scheme if you choose products with A or B rating and Nutri Score. Mm. So we're actually incentivizing yeah, you because they, those points are then converted mm. back into money. Uh, and the same also in the Halliford brand in the US. If you buy basically own brand products, a lot of fresh, a lot of fruit, a lot of veg, they count as own brand. And if you buy those, then they also count more points in your in the loyalty scheme. So we can nudge people along the way. And also, you know, that that information is all visible on websites on packaging. It's not perfect. But in this case, I would say this is where, you know, perfect can be the enemy of good. If we encourage people to do things in the general trend right direction, I think that that's that's beneficial. And what about an eco label, which can also make product more transparent? Um, <laughs> that's that's so the, the advantage with both um, Nutri-Score and with the Guiding Stars is it, it's a it's a calculation which is derived by by I think Nutri score by the French government actually I think or a French, yeah. the French and it's now a transparent calculation which you can apply so in some markets we can't use we can't label things as as Nutri score but we can use the maths and we do use the maths to actually demonstrate to ourselves mm -hmm. that these things are getting more healthy mm -hmm. so we can't nudge people but we we can do the maths I think when you come to try to do eco labeling I think that's really difficult because of the things we talked about in the first case, we really, yeah. if you actually can go right up the value chain and right up into these smallholder farmers to prove 
um, an eco score is just really, really hard. And, you know, when you put things out there, you, the, there's a lot of people out there who perceive us as kind of, you know, one of the big bad animals and we do negative for the environment. We would like to say we're actually, uh, we're purpose driven to the opposite and we do a lot of good, but also if we start claiming something which is untrue, then people yeah. will, will, will yeah, exactly. well, they will lose that credibility in the things we are doing, which mm -hmm. we think yeah. do add value. Yeah. If we talk about consumer engagement, this is Jackie, you know, Google, everyone uh, of consumers <laughs> is using your technology. Any perspective from your end? So I've been listening to this intently and I've been debating on how I'd like to answer that. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, from, from a personal perspective, I mean, you know, all of these ideas I think are fantastic. You know, how we use data to kind of influence, you know, consumer behavior, I think is one thing. But at the end of the day, you, you know, you can put the best ads out there and you can put the best marketing messages and you can use all the different mechanisms to kind of, you know, promote these things. But it's how do you actually fundamentally change consumer behavior? I mean, I think the next gen, the newer generations, um, I have, you know, two boys that are in their early, you know, 20s. And, you know, the way they approach how they eat and their food and like how they're thinking about things is very different from kind of how I grew up. And I think that the more and more we can surface information to help make people make better informed choices is honestly the best thing that you can do. I mean, you can't. It, it's not I don't think it's the responsibility always on the retailer or the manufacturer to kind of like give all of this, because like you said, there's so many different variables that kind of go into that. So I think that there's lots of wonderful things that we can do in terms of providing insight with all the you know, illnesses. And you think about all the things that influence people and kind of the diets and going into the, you know, kind of the, the older generations, people are living longer. There's so many different things that you can kind of tap into, but it's fundamentally, how do you get people to make better choices? You know, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, as a Googler, I don't have that answer, but I can just put that in the, you know, we like to work with client companies that are, you know, trying to help promote the greater good. So I would say that's something that's very important. So if that's the one thing I leave you with, that's definitely a, um, you know, a tenant for us. We want to push that type of thing. So I don't know if that answers that, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's how I look at it. No, thanks, Jackie. I, I mean, it, we're all in a journey and, 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 and learning and there's a new generation stepping up uh, indeed. And there are new, new you know, technologies that, that we at the moment even you know, can, can grasp what they will mean. Maybe as a final question to you, Ron, if you look at future technologies towards consumers, I mean, I don't dare to mention the high word of metaverse, but <laughs> what, what, what do you see coming that could have impact on you know, positive change? In uh, How quick has that changed, by the way, the, the, the notion of the metaverse? Uh, how, you see how quick um, the, the emotion towards a technology can change. Uh, we, we discussed, you know, social media and, and influence and nudge people. And, and before you know it, people say, is that a social credit score? Is it b b because I'm, I'm healthier, you know, and I get benefits as a result of it. So, so you see that the balance between we, we have such phenomenal technology available to, you know, mobilize people and, and change them maybe. And, and on the other hand, they might, you know, might feel, are you changing me? You know, uh, am, I, am I part of a, of a global type of development that tells me what to eat, right? Uh, so, so that's... that's um, I think a fascinating balance act that can change overnight, as has been, by the way, uh, illustrated by, by the metaverse that nowadays a lot of people would say, well, is, is that actually the future of the user experience and the consumer experience, maybe in a different way than we thought. And, and we haven't even really talked about, I think, uh, Lawrence mentioned a little bit, you know, using new type of technology like biotechnology and synthetic biology and be able to change or edit, if you like, DNA and making crops, for example, much more suitable for very specific areas. That's in techniques like CRISPR and others in, in which you do that and you can edit it literally. So, so, so we have quite some explaining to do, I think, in the near future in terms of helping people to realize that, that it helps us, right? That it enables us to deal with, with this obvious food crisis that, that we see coming. Yeah, I think in Europe, um, we're a bit too conservative about uh, crispr cas and, and it can really find solutions. I think so. You know, which can increase the productivity and lower the waste. Uh, and you see that, yes, yeah. also in your portfolio, 
uh, of startups or your your challenges? Uh, what the, the, the biotechnology? Uh, uh, for example, uh, gene, gene editing. DNA editing, yeah, it's a bit more on the egg tech area. I think we see it more in the, in 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 the, in, in at the food side. Um, what I do see is that that uh, it's uh, the, the more disruptive ideas probably uh, tend to come more from the outside than from a market. You refer to Frisland's Campina. It's quite difficult to 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 challenge your own industry if you have ten thousand farmers behind you, and to say let let's 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 make something based on oat. Uh, I mean, so sometimes it's 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 it can accelerate things by by uh, by adopting ideas. From from, uh, from if, if yeah. I can add to that, I mean, you're the ideas of like using, you know, the moonshot ideas, right? How do you use robotics and AI to kind mm -hmm. of looking at, you know, plants and, and regenerative agriculture and all those things? I mean, I think that's super important as well mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, I think the future, the potential is unbelievable, right? I mean, it's just there's nothing that we can't do there. And and I and the other thing I, I should have mentioned earlier on. I, I didn't want to comment specifically on food necessarily, but we, from a Google side, we want to help people make sustainable choices in their lives. So whether you use Google Maps, right, on figuring out like the most, you know, carbon efficient way to get from A to B. As a matter of fact, in Europe, we just announced kind of eco-friendly routes within maps, right? So depending on the kind of car you have, you know, helps you get there. Of course, we're being in the Netherlands, let's, you know, ride our bicycles or walk, right? Let's, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's do that at that other kind of, countries as well, right? Not only the Netherlands. Right, of course. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there's other things that we yeah. can surface up to kind of, it might not be food related, but help people be live healthier, right? So, you know, that, that was the other thing I should have mentioned before, so. Mm. No, thank you, Jackie. And with that, I'd, I'd like to um, come to a close of this uh, discussion. There's a lot of energy, maybe for the after party also to, to further discuss on. Um, we'll eat all the foods. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we need to not waste food here. So I, I, I think on the one hand, we, we, we see there's still a lot of co complexity and there's still a whole, whole way to go. We're early stages, Laurens, very early stages. At the same time, uh, we also see there's a lot of opportunity. We, uh, as Kipjemna, recently uh, re uh, published a report called A World in Balance. And what we uh, uh, saw from interviews with many executives, that still too many, over half of them, um, see this topic as uh, an unwelcome cost driver. Mm. And we see that those companies that are taking the lead, and this, this see, see this as an opportunity to invest, invest with a clear return, mm. those companies are performing much better and so it's a as you call it on a journey with benefits it's a journey with benefits mm -hmm. yes it's 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 not either or it's not a purpose versus performance no it's it's no. joining the the two up and i think that's the positive message that we can take away as as a as an opportunity uh, also and that's uh, relinking to our food for a better world initiative in collaboration with each other an individual company uh, can only do so much when you combine forces and accelerate and innovate together, um, impact will be much bigger. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for uh, the fruitful discussions um, and indeed as a trigger to further step up um, us individually as well as the companies that uh, we, pre we represent. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.